thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I, we all know that uh, sustainability is a very important topic. Uh, we are constantly thinking about sustainability of species, uh, sustainability of our environment, sustainability of the human population. Uh, I think of sustainability together with another term, uh, collapse, because we have uh, collapses going on all around us all the time, and part of the whole evolution of our society, of our uh, culture, uh, and of our species and like is really built on a combination of some things running very smoothly and moving into the future and other things uh, collapsing. So I'm going to talk about sustainability both from an environmental standpoint but also in a broader standpoint of sustainability and collapse in a wider variety of, uh, of venues. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask a question of the people in the audience here. How many people in the audience can uh, would feel comfortable telling me what the figure is that's shown on the first slide. I see a couple of tentative hands, not really an overwhelming uh, confidence that you know really what the slide is. And if I made the question more specific and said, what is the name, not the species, but the actual name of the bird on that slide, I bet there's probably only one or two people that would know the answer. I see a couple of heads nodding. Uh, that bird is named Martha. That is the famous last passenger pigeon. And I'm very glad to have a chance to talk to you today, and I'm very glad that you're here, because we should all know about Martha, because of the lessons that uh, that story really gives us about our own future. A few centuries ago, the most populous bird on Earth was the passenger pigeon. They inhabited the eastern part of the United States. They spent the uh, winters in the southern uh, United States and uh, they, they uh, then moved north to uh, breed in Michigan and Pennsylvania and upstate New York and in southern Canada and when these birds traveled around they traveled together in flocks that might number a uh, hundred million or even a billion birds the skies were said to turn dark when a flock of passenger pigeons passed over and it might take a whole day for a flock to pass. You don't see flocks of birds like that anywhere today. What is really amazing to me is that we obliterated them. We completely eliminated the passenger pigeon. I can understand how we could eliminate the rhinoceros, the elephant, some species that are certainly in danger these days because they have a limited space to, to move in and they, they have limited numbers. But a billion birds can't escape from people trying to hunt them down, for example. It's, uh, it's really uh, an amazing story. And, and we'll come back to it a little bit later on. But before we uh, do that, let me just say that uh, I've been working in the environmental business for a long time, not only in academia, but uh, in the consulting world. Uh, and a lot of people say, what's a mathematician doing working, working in, the, uh, in the environmental sphere? And uh, I say mathematics is the field that you use when you want to understand the quantitative relationships between things, like the decrease in the population of a species, uh, the collapse of a, uh, of a stock market, uh, a, uh, a collapse of some kind of a, a, a plant, like the plant in, in Japan. You're interested in trying to understand quantitatively how much risk there is to different kinds of things and, and uh, how you might head off collapses of such uh, things in the future. Almost every environmental question, at least, is a quantitative question. What is the risk to this? What is the impact of a change in CO2 levels to the global temperature? What is the uh, effect of a, a, a change in uh, pesticide uh, use to the population of different species? All these questions are quantitative questions. And I use mathematics to try to put a quantitative framework on these kinds of questions and make some headway uh, in really trying to answer them. The work I do is very interdisciplinary. It's using mathematics to bring together many different other fields. Economics, biology, chemistry, physics, meteorology. Many different areas come together, but the unifying theme is really the mathematics. And uh, when I look at sustainability and collapse, uh, I see six different uh, phenomena, six different kinds of 
dynamics that are fundamental to understanding uh, collapse, understanding uh, sustainability issues, and really quite different from each other. Uh, let me give you a, 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 a brief rundown. As you can see on the slide, the first one is uh, low probability events. Uh, you all know that the, uh, you've probably heard that the dinosaurs were most likely done in uh, by a low probability event, the crash of, a, of an asteroid off the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico that created so much dust and the like that it changed the Earth's climate and the dinosaurs were unable to adapt to the, uh, to the change. Um, you are aware of the Japanese of Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster. Low probability event again. You had a, an underground, undersea earthquake led to a giant tidal wave wiped out the plant, wiped out a lot of the uh, coastline of Japan, wreaked havoc in so many, many ways, uh, and we didn't anticipate it, or at least the Japanese plant operator uh, did not anticipate it. We don't do a good job of estimating uh, low probability events. We could do a much better job of doing that, and there are mathematical methods that would, would let us do that. A number of years ago, I was asked by the Environmental Protection Agency to carry out a quantitative risk analysis of the uh, idea of burying radioactive waste in abandoned salt mines in different parts of the country. And one of the areas of the country that was considered was along the Gulf Coast, because there are lots of salt mines along the Gulf Coast. And one of the things that we were concerned about was the risk that somebody in the future would drill into one of these uh, uh, salt mines that had the radioactive waste in them and release the radioactive waste to the environment. So to try to understand that and to try to quantify the probability of that, so one in a million, one in a billion, one in a thousand, what is the probability of that? I went down with some of my colleagues and we took a helicopter out to the Gulf Coast and we landed on some drilling rigs and some production platforms and talked to the operators down there about, is there any risk when you're drilling? Do you know where you're drilling into? Do you know what, is there any risk, any chance at all that you could go into some uh, uh, underground salt mine? They said, absolutely no, probability zero. It's impossible, you know exactly where we're going. We also went down into some salt mines along the Gulf Coast, and the people, we said to them, do you, uh, do you worry about those drill rigs that are up in the, in the Gulf of Mexico? Do you worry that one of their drills might be going sideways or something and come down into your salt mine? Not at all, not at all. They know where we are, we know where they are, no problem. And then, I think it was uh, November 1980, a Texaco drill rig put a large hole, I think about a 12-inch diameter hole, right down into an operating diamond crystal salt mine in Jefferson Island in, in Louisiana and changed the whole way people looked at the risk from events of that type. In fact, it was so disastrous that the drill rig, which was on a barge, and about half a dozen other barges disappeared as an entire lake went flying down through this enlarging hole into the salt mine to be buried. They've never been seen since. These, these components, and they're somewhere in the earth between the surface and the, uh, and the old salt mine. The people in the salt mine went running out the other end, up the shaft as fast as they could. Nobody lost their lives, but we learned a big lesson. We don't do a good job at estimating low probability events, but we have methods that could help us do a better job. We have mathematical methods for doing some kinds of things like that. Group behavior is another interesting phenomenon that can lead to uh, collapse type issues, either in the environmental sphere or in other spheres. The environmental sphere, the passenger pigeon, like many birds, used to fly around in flocks. You don't see, you see a lot of birds that do fly around in flocks. They group together. They look for food together. They protect each other from predators. They mate sometimes only when they're in larger groups. So uh, some kinds of, of uh, group behavior uh, is natural to certain kinds of species and to humans, we, uh, lots of humans follow the same investment uh, uh, patterns in the stock market. When everybody follows the same investment patterns, that can actually cut down on the returns and can lead to greater risk. Because if everybody changes their mind at a certain point, then things can crash. Group behavior can cause a lot of problems. For the passenger pigeon, the fact that they flew around in groups made it really easy for people to hunt them. Because they, this big flock would come in, you could, they even loaded uh, uh, shotgun pellets into cannons and shot them into these flocks of passenger pigeons, had them come down by the, by the hundreds. Uh, and then 
They convinced, uh, they used to uh, kill the passenger pigeons for food for animals, but they, uh, then somebody, some smart marketing person decided, let's try to convince the people in New York that passenger pigeons are a delicacy to eat. Well, and it worked. All of a sudden, all the greatest New York restaurants wanted boxcar loads of passenger pigeons to feed to their patrons. Group behavior again. So group behavior is an interesting dynamic and it's something that we can also model mathematically. Uh, games and evolution, the third uh, lens at which, through which I like to look at, at collapse. Uh, you know, we live in, a, in an environment where we compete and cooperate with each other. Uh, uh, companies uh, buy things from each other, but they also compete with each other. Uh, species interact with each other in cooperative ways, but then they also compete with each other. What really happens is that as different entities compete with each other, they evolve and uh, uh, gradually change their characteristics to take advantage of their environment. What people don't often pay as much attention to is not only does the individual species evolve, because that's usually kind of slow, but the whole ecosystem evolves. And the ecosystem evolves a lot faster than the individuals in it. Usually the individuals in it die off as the ecosystem kind of changes and other groups of species come in and replace them. So the evolution of ecosystems is something that we can often model effectively mathematically and is something that's really key to issues of sustainability and collapse. Then we come to this topic of instability. Now instability is a really, uh, it, it, it's all over the place, but does anybody in the audience have a book that I could borrow for a second? Thank you. Uh, Watch this experiment for a second, if, if you will. I'm gonna take this book, I'm gonna spin it. It stayed kind of in its trajectory as I spun it around. Do the same thing going the other way, except for the cover flapping, it flips just fine. But now watch this next one. I'm gonna go on the third axis of symmetry, this one here, you think it's gonna flip fine, right? Oh, doesn't do it, look at it carefully now. It won't even stay anywhere near the trajectory that I put it on when I flipped it, because that's an unstable, mode of motion for this thing. And uh, we have to be very careful about things becoming unstable because when something is unstable, like the book, it flies off its trajectory very, very quickly and uh, the motion here really essentially disintegrated and collapsed. So instability is something that can, can lead to gross changes in the environment uh, uh, and the like. Uh, Nonlinearity, sometimes you think that the the future is going to be the same way it's been, things have been in the past. You think that if you always got 5% interest on your bank account, that you're going to get 5% interest on your bank account going into the future. Now we've all been disabused of that philosophy. Now we don't get any interest on the future. But I spent many years just assuming I could get 5% interest on my bank account. I made a linear assumption that the future would continue along the same line that it was in the past, and it was wrong. And there are many spectacular cases of nonlinearities, of, of deviations from that linear assumption that have caused things to really, uh, really collapse. And we need to understand those things. When you think about weather forecasting and how hard it is to predict the weather, how hard it is to understand where a hurricane is going to hit the Gulf Coast, even a couple of days before it gets there, you're dealing with nonlinear effects, very unpredictable uh, kinds of effects. And uh, my last category that's also amenable to mathematical analysis is, is network effects. You've all uh, experienced power outages. You may well remember major power outages like a, the Northeast power blackout of about a dozen years ago, where the whole Northeast lost power because a power line was carrying more current than someone had planned on. Because it was getting hotter from carrying the current, it expanded. Because it expanded, it drooped more, and it drooped enough to hit a branch on a tree, creating a short circuit, shorted out the power line. Now the next power line is carrying more current to make up for that. The same thing happens to that one, and all of a sudden you have this propagation of collapse through the entire network of power supply. So these topics of probability events, group behavior, games and evolution, instability, nonlinearity, and network effects are key to understanding uh, collapse processes. 
So we look at these different uh, uh, collapses from uh, a number of different points of view, and it brings me to really the bottom line of my talk, and that is that the, uh, the most important way to head off collapses or to manage collapses in the future. I mean, you may want some. You want to, we like the fact the Soviet Union collapsed. We like the fact that polio is collapsing. We try to get tumors to collapse. Uh, but for one way or another, the best way to manage collapses is to understand the dynamics behind them, how they occur. And, and I think that mathematical methods are one of the key tools for really structuring our analysis of those methods. And that's why I I think mathematics has a lot to contribute to this, uh, to this field in concert with other disciplines. So thank you very much.